It's the 19th of March, 1286. Alexander III, King of Scots, is riding to meet his young wife, when he falls from his horse and breaks his neck. Alexander has no surviving children, and the closest heir to the throne of Scotland is his granddaughter Margaret, a three-year-old child living in Norway. Her mother, the Queen of Norway, died during childbirth. Margaret is sent to Scotland, and arrangements are made for a council of guardians to govern until she reaches maturity. But upon reaching the Orkney Islands, tragedy strikes. Margaret falls ill and dies. The royal line is now extinct, and Scotland descends into chaos. There are 14 claimants to the throne. Two of them, Robert de Bruce, fifth lord of Annandale, and John Balliol, lord of Galloway, have the best claim. Both are members of the high nobility, both of Anglo-Norman descent. Armies soon gather to defend the various claims. The lords of Scotland decide they must prevent a civil war at all cost, so they ask Edward I, king of England, to arbitrate. Edward is the archetype of the medieval warrior king. In his youth he helped crush the Barons' Rebellion, then he went on crusade and by the 1280s conquered Wales after interfering in the country's internal struggles. His intention now is to do the same thing with Scotland. He proposes a council of 104 to arbitrate. 40 delegates would be from Bruce, 40 from Balliol, and 24 would be nominated by Edward, making him the one to decide. In return, he demands that the Scots recognize the English king's overlordship over Scotland. In the 12th century, Scotland had been a vassal of England for a short time, and since then English kings have claimed sovereignty over Scotland. The Scottish lords respond that only a Scottish king can speak for the country, however they themselves will individually recognize Edward as their feudal overlord. With this over, in 1292 the majority of the council, including some of Bruce's delegates, elect John Balliol as John I of Scotland. John proves to be a weak king, and Edward exploits this to the fullest. He demands the Scots pay him homage, that King John submit to English law in an English court, and that the Scots send him soldiers for his war with France. The Scottish magnates find this preposterous, and pressure the king to ally instead with France. In 1295, the Old Alliance, a treaty of mutual assistance, comes into effect between Scotland and France. Edward takes this as a declaration of war, and the following year he sends a punitive expedition against the Scots. After the sack of Berwick, the two armies meet at Dunbar, and the Scots are soundly defeated. Resistance ceases, and the English occupy the country. Balliol is arrested and brought to London. Later, on the condition he stays out of politics, he is allowed to leave for France. John stays true to his word and spends the rest of his life in exile, never to return to Scotland. Back in Scotland, as soon as the main English army leaves, a series of localized rebellions break out. William Wallace, a minor knight of Welsh origin, is the leader of a revolt. He soon emerges to lead a united rebel army and the Scots recapture much of the country by 1297. In September, they arrive at Dundee and lay siege to the city. An English army is sent to relieve Dundee. To get there, they have to cross the river Forth as Stirling. Stirling is the gateway to Scotland. Anyone who controls it controls Scotland itself. The rebels decide to meet the English at this strategic location. The river forms a deep loop in the marshy ground where the bridge crosses to the Scottish side. This offers perfect concealment for the Scots. The English start to cross the river, however, it will take hours for the whole army to get across. The Scots hold back for now. They allow a sufficient number of English to cross that they can confidently defeat. Attack! When they attack, they sweep away the English army. The bridge collapses and with nowhere to run, the English vanguard is wiped out almost to the last man. The enemy army retreats and the Scots are victorious. One reason for this is a new type of infantry. Armed with long pikes and fighting in dense blocks of infantry in the Flemish tradition, the Scots prove that in certain situations footmen can defeat an army of knights. However, the victory at Stirling Bridge only buys the Scots a short respite. Edward makes a separate peace with France and returns to England. At the head of a large army made up of heavy cavalry, spearmen and archers, he proceeds north to invade Scotland. The Scots are waiting for him at Falkirk. Most of their army is made up of pikemen. 
The pikemen are arranged in four large pike blocks called shieldrons. Between the shieldrons there are small numbers of archers. The cavalry that is largely provided by the barons is in the back. Two groups of knights from the English vanguard arrive ahead of the main army. They fall upon the Scots from two sides. They scatter the unprotected archers, but the shieldrons themselves prove to be insurmountable. A large number of knights are killed, and when Edward arrives on the battlefield, he calls off the attack. Seeing the enormous English army, the baronial cavalry deserts the field. Now the pikemen are alone, however they are still confident they can withstand the onslaught of the English cavalry. Edward chooses a different approach. He orders his archers to shower the Scots with arrows. Thousands of Welsh longbowmen shower the Scots with arrows, firing 14 arrows per minute each. With the static shield from Sophomore, Edward's cavalry descends on them. The Battle of Forkirk ends with a monumental defeat for the Scots. Wallace narrowly escapes and subsequently resigns his guardianship of Scotland. He is replaced by Robert the Bruce, grandson of Robert, 5th Lord of Annandale, and John Comyn, Lord of Badenoch, an ally of Balliol. Fighting continues and Edward invades again. This time his son joins him, leading an army in the west, while Edward himself, with the main army, invades from the east. The Scots nobles are forced to surrender. Most are shown clemency, but Edward demands Wallace's head. Wallace is apprehended by the Scottish nobility and delivered to the English. In 1305, he is hung, drawn and quartered. Scottish resistance ceases. With Wallace gone, Edward turns his attention to Robert the Bruce. Given his lineage, he has the best claim to the throne of Scotland and is therefore a great danger to Edward. He is also an inconvenience to Comyn, who wants John Balliol to return to rule the kingdom. Therefore, Comyn accuses Bruce of plotting against Edward. When Bruce finds out, he ambushes Comyn and kills him in a church. Comyn's allies and the English king are outraged. Bruce is declared an outlaw. In an all-or-nothing move, his supporters swiftly crown him King of Scots at Scone in 1306. He is now the rightful ruler of Scotland, however half the country and the English king are against him. Soon he is defeated and becomes a fugitive. He is saved by his allies, the Macdonalds of the Western Isles, who hide him during this difficult time and provide him with troops. In 1307, Bruce returns to the mainland and his cause slowly gathers ground. Edward prepares to invade again, but this time luck is on Robert's side. Edward I dies before reaching Scotland, and under his incompetent son, Edward II, England becomes consumed with internal squabbles. With the English no longer a threat, Bruce heads up the west coast and finally defeats the Comyns and their allies, the MacDougalls. By 1314, he recaptures most of the country and even goes on raids into northern England. In the spring, the Scots lay siege to Stirling. They agree with the defenders, themselves Scots, that the castle will surrender if it's not relieved by the 24th of July. Given the situation, Edward II has no other choice but to attack. He gathers a large army of 15,000. His main striking force is made up of 2,500 heavy cavalry. The infantry are mostly levies and militia. Half are longbowmen, the other half are spearmen. The Scottish army is far smaller, at 6,500. The bulk of the force are pikemen, arranged in three shieldrons of 1,800 men each. There are around 500 bowmen and a few hundred light cavalry. The English objective is to relieve Stirling Castle before the 24th of July. Stirling can be reached via the Old Roman Road, or another road called the Way. Two small streams cut through the landscape, the Bannockburn and the Pastream Burn. Boggy wetland and the River Forth are to the east. The high ground is dominated by several forests, the King's Park, New Park and the Wood of Balkiderock. The Scots are well hidden in New Park. They are arranged for a retreat, the most likely outcome given the disparate numbers. The vanguard is led by Moray, the middle division by Edward, the King's brother, and the rear by the King himself. As at Falkirk, units of English cavalry arrive ahead of the main army. The first division decides to probe the old Roman road. Henry de Bohun, a prominent English knight, rides ahead. 
Robert the Bruce emerges from the forest to meet him. They both charge, and Bruce buries an axe in Bowen's head. Emboldened by their commander's action, his children emerges from the woods and crushes the oncoming cavalry. On the other side, the other division heads down the way, hoping to find a clear path to Sterling. They are met by Maury's children, who promptly repulse if they wish. Edward arrives with the main army and is disheartened by the events. He decides to rest his soldiers and attack the Scots the next day. To this end, the English cross the Bannockburn and set up camp to the east of the Scots in a boggy field called the Cars of Barky the Rock. This seems like a good idea, given that the next day's objective will be to clear the Scots for New Park and take the roads leading to Stirling Castle. During the night, the Scots contemplate the retreat, however they decide to fight when a deserter informs them that the English army is demoralized and ripe for defeat. At first light, the Scottish Shilterns emerge from the woods. The English are startled by this bold move. Most of their army already faces the Scots, so retreat is not an option. The first to engage are the archers. The English bowmen win the archery duel, however they are unable to stop the advance of the Scottish children. The English cavalry is next. Banner after banner charges the Scots to no avail. With all his army engaged, it's all or nothing for Robert the Bruce now. As more English charge, they are funneled into the narrow space between the wood of Balkidor and the past river. The front ranks are cramped together, unable to fight. They are pushed onto the Scottish spears, while the rear ranks are trampled as they try to escape. The archers try to save the day, shooting the Scots from the flank. However, they are countered by the timely intervention of the Scottish light cavalry. The English are pushed deeper and deeper into boggy ground. Soldiers are running away, left and right. The king himself is extracted from the battlefield by his men. He seeks refuge at Stirling Castle, but the commander refuses to open the gates. Therefore, he must circle around the Scots to reach safety. Luckily for him, the Scots lack sufficient cavalry to pursue. What's left of his army, however, is in complete disarray and he is forced to retreat from Scotland. The Scots recapture all of their country in the subsequent years, even raiding as far as York. As England is still divided under the incompetent Edward II, Bruce makes an attempt to capture Ireland. His army is beaten, however, by the determined local English lords. In 1320, the Declaration of Arbroath is adopted, earning recognition for Scotland from the Pope. No one can doubt it now that Scotland is an independent country, separate from the English crown. In 1327, Edward II is deposed, being replaced by his son, Edward III. The new king makes peace with the Scots in 1328. Bruce's reign is now secure. When he dies, he is succeeded by his son, David III. John Balliol's son, Edward, invades the kingdom with English help. Despite winning several battles, David manages to keep his throne. In 1337, the Hundred Years' War breaks out and the English shift their attention to France. The old alliance remains in effect until 1560, however, eventually, as both countries become Protestants, the Scots start to warm up to the English. Eventually, in 1603, the two countries unite under King James. Bannockburn was the most important battle for Scotland, however, the war had other far-reaching consequences. The English learned the importance of terrain from Bannockburn. From Falkirk, they learned the power of the longbow. From Stirling Bridge, they learned that infantry can defeat cavalry. Henceforth, the English knights dismounted for battle, forming a bulwark against cavalry. Longbows became the main offensive weapon, and the English chose the battlefield carefully. This became known as the English way of fighting, used to full effect at Gracie and Agincourt.